Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we will learn everything about beta blockers. This is great for beginners and those who are more familiar with this class of drugs, you will still learn a thing or two. If you like these kind of short clinical videos that incorporates a lot of images to help you visualize and memorize the information, then hit the like button and also subscribe for more of these. Thank you. Beta blockers refer to drugs that bind to the beta receptors and inhibit it. There are two main beta receptors that are clinically important beta 1 and beta 2. There is a third one, but it's not really that important in our clinical practice. The main ligands that bind to these receptors are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Altogether, these are responsible for the body's fight or flight response. Fight or flight is your body's reaction to an event that is perceived as stressful or frightening like being chased by a tiger. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this, but keep this in mind when we discuss the effect seen when these ligands bind to the beta receptors in different parts of the body. The beta-1 receptor can be found in the heart's kidneys and fat cells. In the hearts, it increases the heart rate, the contraction, and the outputs. This will help blood flow to vital organs for when you're running from that tiger. Kidney will also release renin, which will lead to the production of angiotensin II, a potent vasoconstrictor to shunt the blood to vital organs during this run from the tiger. Stored fat is broken down in this case and converted to glucose to be used as energy. Next is the beta-2 receptor. This could be found in the lungs, blood vessels, liver, pancreas, bladder, intestines, uterus, and the eyes. Okay, let's try this again with the fight or flight concept. A tiger is chasing you. You want your airways to be open or closed? Open, easy. The beta-2 receptors in the vasculature will dilate in this case, and this will also improve the blood flow to the pertinent organs needed during fight or flight. The liver does two things during fight or flight. First, it synthesizes glucose in a metabolic process known as gluconeogenesis. Second, glycogenolysis, breakdown glycogen, which is a stored form of glucose. The glucose would then be released into the blood. The pancreas would then release insulin so that the glucose in the blood can be moved into the cells to be used as energy. When the beta-2 receptors are stimulated in the bladder, it holds on to the urine so that you can run from that tiger. In the intestines, contraction and peristalsis is decreased because this is not the time to be digesting anything. In the uterus, the muscles relax so that the mother can hold on to the baby. And in the eye, the pupil dilates so you can see clearer and run from the tiger. This also unfortunately reduces the outflow of aqueous fluid in your eye and can potentially increase your intraocular pressure. So everything I've discussed so far is what happens in normal circumstances when epinephrine or norepinephrine binds to these receptors. Now let's take a look at what will happen in these organs when beta blockers block these receptors. This will give us an idea of what disease states we can use them for and potential side effects also. For beta-1 receptor inhibition, in the heart it will lead to decreased heart rate, contraction, and cardiac output. In the kidneys, renin will not be released, so this will promote more vasodilation. If we inhibit fat breakdown, we will store more fats. Next is the beta-2 receptors. Blockage in the bronchioles leads to bronchoconstriction. In the blood vessels, you will get vasoconstriction. Instead of the liver making glucose and breaking down glycogen, it will store more of it. And of course, if there is a decreased glucose being released into the bloodstream, there will be less insulin released also. In the bladder, it will promote urination, promote peristalsis and movement of content through the GI. The uterus will contract, the pupil will constrict and also improve the outflow of the aqueous humor and reduce the intraocular pressure. Now that we have an understanding of the mechanism and the general effects of the beta receptor inhibition, we will learn about the common beta blockers on the market and some of their indications. The beta blockers medications are divided into two main categories. First is the beta-1 selective inhibitors, which are also known as cardioselective beta-1 inhibitors because they mainly block beta receptors in the hearts and later on, when we discuss the beta-1 blockers indications, it will all be coherent. So here are the cardioselective beta blockers. For the beta-1, beta-2 inhibitors, or the non-selective inhibitors, here are the examples. If you peruse this closely, you will notice that most of the beta-2 selective are more in the beginning part of the alphabet, except for a few. While most of the beta-1, beta-2 
Non-selective inhibitors are towards the middle to end part of the alphabet except for a few. Now let's learn about the different uses of these agents. Hypertension is due to their vasodilatory effect. Chest pain because they can minimize the oxygen demand of the heart by reducing the heart's rate. This also applies for when it's used after an MI. In heart failure, beta blockers are able to protect the heart from the upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system. We will review this in depth later. Of course, we could use it for tachycardia arrhythmias based on their mechanism. This is straightforward. In glaucoma, because beta receptor blockage helps improve the outflow of the aqueous humor and lessen the intraocular pressure. Finally, beta blockers are used for tremors, with the exact mechanism not being fully understood, but it's believed that norepinephrine and epinephrine stimulation of the muscles directly is one of the causes of tremors, so blocking them helps. So beta blockers are great. They are used to manage several medical conditions, but just like any other medication, they have side effects. Fatigue, dizziness, bradycardia, and hypotension, these should not be memorized. This should make sense because of the mechanism of beta blockers. And also the decreased blood flow can result in sexual dysfunction. Another side effect that's easy to understand is the bronchoconstriction. Mainly seen with the non-selective beta blockers blocking beta-2 receptors in the lungs, which will lead to a constriction of the bronchioles. Insomnia because beta blockers reduce synthesis of melatonin, a hormone that helps you sleep. And now for my favorite part, clinical pearls. Clinical pearls are like fun, interesting facts about a medication or a concept. First, I want to make a few points regarding the use of beta blockers for heart failure. Now, out of all the beta blockers, only three are approved for heart failure. Bisoprolol, Carvedilol, and Metoprolol succinate. Now, if heart failure is associated with a decreased cardiac output due to dysfunctional contraction and beta blockers also reduce cardiac output, then why do we use them? So traditionally, beta blockers didn't have any role in heart failure. They were actually contraindicated. But also, when we treat a heart failure back then, we used to focus a lot on the hemodynamic abnormalities, like maintaining blood pressure and improving the cardiac output. Studies later on confirmed that this method of approach only provided short-term improvement, but did not prolong life. So researchers analyzed the pathophysiology of heart failure further, and they found that patients with heart failure have an increase in activation of the sympathetic nervous system. With elevated levels of catecholamines like norepinephrine, this has been hypothesized to be the mechanism responsible for the progression of heart failure because over time, hormones like norepinephrine may promote necrosis, fibrosis, and apoptosis in the heart. Treatment now includes beta blockers to block the sympathetic activity. They are considered as disease-modifying agents rather than rescue agents, and they have been shown to improve survival as well. Plus, one more thing. Not all patients will be candidates for beta blockers, especially patients with baseline bradycardia. Let's learn about other clinical pearls and interesting facts about beta blockers. So the metoprolol comes as tartrate or succinate. The brand name for the tartrate is Lopressa, and for the succinate, it's Toprolexel. The tartrate is immediate release, so it can be taken more than once a day, while the succinate is extended release and taken once a day. The tartrate is mainly used for hypertension, angina, and postmyocardial infarction. And the succinate is for hypertension, angina, and heart failure. So the succinate is the one that has shown most benefit in heart failure. Now, is there a third subcategory of beta blockers? Let's see. We are familiar with the two, the beta-1 selective and the non-selectives. And there's actually another subcategory known as the beta-1, beta-2 non-selectives plus alpha-1 inhibition. And the drugs in this subcategory are carvedilol and labetalol. The alpha blockade leads to peripheral vasodilation. Because of this, these agents have a larger effect on lowering blood pressure. Beta blockers can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia, such as a rapid heartbeat and tremors. Sotolol can prolong the QT interval, so make sure you monitor this in your patients. Timolol and Betaxolol are examples of beta blockers that are used to treat glaucoma. Timolol is a non-selective inhibitor, while Betaxolol is a selective. So there's a significant amount of beta blockers that require renal adjustments. Hepatic is also required for some. 
So always check for this. But keep in mind that there are no renal adjustments for metoprolol, carvedilol, and labetalol. Now, abrupt discontinuation of beta blockers can lead to a rebound effect characterized by tachycardia and hypertension. The use of beta blockers in pregnancy and research has not shown any birth defects or preterm birth, but women taking beta blockers were more likely to have smaller babies. However, a smaller baby can be due to underlying health conditions that beta blockers are commonly used to treat, like high blood pressure. It is therefore difficult to know if a beta blocker has also contributed to the baby being small. And that'll be the end of this video. If you learn at least one thing from it, or you like my presentation style, then hit the like button, subscribe for more videos like these, and leave a comment and questions down below. Also follow my Instagram at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video and take care.